Miroslav, it's an interesting format because um, there'll be people here in the Zoom room, but also the studios. A lot of people have their own TVs, so students are watching it in their studios. And then there's the YouTube live stream, so there's people there. So right, multimedia, viewing. yeah, multimedia, great. I'm gonna try at the end if if there's time for questions, I'll try to monitor all the different emails and uh, YouTube and see what we get. Great. <laughs> Great, great. Yeah, I'll try to uh, keep it, I think, around like 15 minutes or so, hopefully. So. Yeah, no worries. Whatever, yeah. whatever you want to do. But yeah, thanks. <laughs> and Corey, you're the host again. Okay. Um, and you set your account up for Zoom streaming um, for final reviews before, right? I think I did a long time ago. It says stop live stream if I click the button. So I think it must work. Yeah. Awesome. Sounds good. Hey, how are you? Good. Hi, Michelle. So great to see you. So good to see you again as well. I think we ran, last ran into each other at, wasn't it SciArc? The thesis reviews. Yes, uh, yeah. it was quite an event. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's yeah, two yeah. speaking to me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was a while ago. We had pre-pandemic when we were all getting together. But yeah. I'm sure I'm really looking forward to visit in, in person. Um, yeah, I, 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 I am so looking forward to having you here. Have you ever been to, been to, Never. You know, to Austin? Never. No. So I'm so, so excited to come. Yeah. Well, I can promise it'll be a great experience. And I think the other thing that's really wonderful about our school is this, you know, fantastic mix of undergrads and grads, uh, as well as undergrads that, that cross into interior design. So, you know, so many different things can foreground and so many different activities are happening and, and so many different um, aspects that, uh, you know, I think at, at Yale, you just kind of don't have that that opportunity yeah. to confront and, and be engaged in. Yeah, no, that's very true. No, I'm very, very excited to, to kind of be here this semester and, and visit uh, hopefully very soon. Yeah. So Clay, what do you think? Should we start? I think, uh, sorry, I think maybe give it one or one minute or two more. Sure. Nice trash can in the background. So yeah, it looks like you're in studio. <laughs> <laughs> the fanciest backgrounds for you, Miroslav. <laughs> looks perfect. It's actually very uh, abstractly, nicely, compositionally. Perfect. You know, yes, right in my head. Right yeah, there. exactly. <laughs> No, thank you. Thank you for, for joining us. We can't wait till you are able to, to get on campus, but it's uh, looking forward to this. Well, thank you so much for the invitation. Yeah, yeah it looks like things are ticking up, uh, Corey. Maybe, maybe it's good to get going. Sure. Yeah, I'll go ahead and get started. So, uh, hello, I'm Corey Beeg. I'm the program director for architecture here at University of Texas at Austin. And it's my pleasure to introduce Miroslava Brooks. Miroslava is on the faculty of Yale School of Architecture and University of Pennsylvania's Weizmann School of Design. And this semester, we are incredibly honored to have her join our faculty as a visiting professor and Qualic Endowed Chair. Miroslava Brooks is co-founder and principal with Daniel Markovich of Forma, an office based in New York. Forma has completed and continues to develop a range of building types from homes, private residences, and multifamily housing, Two, and I love the way you use this term, commons, cultural, educational, and institutional projects at various scales. And in addition to the many awards, accolades, and publications they have received, they most recently uh, are the winner of the Architects Newspaper 2021 Best of Design Award in the Unbuilt category for their pink thermal baths project, which I hope we see. Um, I think what is so striking about the work of Forma is that it touches on so many disciplinary questions that have been asked over many, many years. In particular, questions of form and part whole relationships. Um, in their work, you see how they address issues that Eisenman was dealing with uh, in terms of the positive negative datum or ideas of an almost um, anti object that Kengo Kuma was exploring at a different scale. 
or a post-contradiction, a postmodern contradiction of parts and wholes, all the way into the sort of part logics that are familiar to algorithmic or computational designers. And I think what is refreshing about their work is that their projects are not actually any of these things, but they almost feel as if they have absorbed them as first principles and now offer us a contemporary version of what the next step in that evolution might be. I think in line with that idea is that um, when you are working with a formal logic that includes a variety of forms or parts, that each part is just a version or one option from a range of many possibilities. And that the success of an overall project is not necessarily dependent on a particular form or the result of picking the absolute best parts, which is to say that there are multiple great buildings in every one of their projects. And I think that's true. You can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but I think it might explain a little bit why not only are their built projects so great, but their unbuilt work is absolutely amazing as well. And I'm sure that has a lot to do with your um, representation of the projects as grounded in the real world, dealing with all of the constraints any building has to engage, while also pushing the envelope of what is possible via the virtual medium of, of computers and rendering. And so even though I look forward to seeing you very soon in person here at UT, uh, there's something about the virtuality of the work that matches this format that we've, we are in right now and that we've been in for the last two years. Um, so with that, please join me in giving a very warm virtual welcome to Miroslava Brooks. Thank you so much, Corey, for, for the wonderful introduction. And again, thank you for, for the invitation to, to talk about our work and also participate uh, in the school life through, through the teaching of the studio. So I'm very, very excited about this. So let me see if I can share a screen and let me rearrange a few of these here. Uh, let's see, can you see the title screen or which one? Yeah, so it's just format. Great. Uh, okay, so uh, I'll try to kind of keep uh, an eye on time, um, but um, all the work that I'll show today is from our office, Forma, as Corey mentioned, which I run together with my friend and colleague, uh, Daniel Markievicz. Um, but um, when I was thinking about the title for this lecture, uh, I wanted to capture a few key terms that I think go into any kind of creative process or discipline, especially architecture. And yes, the triple O is coincidental. It has nothing to do with object-oriented ontology, if somebody was wondering. Uh, but the three things that kept really running in my uh, head were obsessions, uh, obstacles, and opportunities. And so the first thing, um, the obsessions are really things that drive us forward, that get us excited, that preoccupy our thoughts and design processes. And I think it's really easy to get discouraged because architecture can be a difficult profession, but, but I do believe it's crucial to kind of develop certain creative obsessions that carry you forward, that kind of make you want to explore more. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about that uh, throughout the lecture. The second one, uh, I want to talk a little bit about obstacles that we've encountered so far. As I think sometimes lectures tend to focus uh, only on the accomplishments, but I think that often given that, that kind of gives students uh, an illusion that architecture is a seamless process and that every attempt ends with a success, which is not always the case. However, I do think that often what may be perceived as an obstacle can be actually turned into an opportunity to really rethink the given problem or situation. So I want to a bit talk about that as well. Um, today, uh, I will show a mixture of residential work and what we call, as Corey already mentioned, comments. So the kind of projects uh, uh, of kind of cultural, commercial, educational programs that really bring people together collectively. Uh, some are client-based and some are more speculative. And I'll do it more or less in kind of comparative pairs to really tease out some recurring themes and commonalities. Um, we usually work across various scales and typologies, but primarily through buildings. Uh, we don't really focus on um, installations or furniture, at least not yet, um, because the buildings really allow us to kind of test different ideas about how to inhabit the world around us. Um, so, uh, and this should be a little video. Uh, let me know if it's not 
streaming. It's kind of a semi video image. <laughs> but first, um, a few just brief words about who we are. Uh, Daniel and I met in graduate school at Yale. Uh, we were one year apart. Um, and afterwards, we work in different offices on the East Coast for several years. Daniel worked at Dillard Scafidia and Renfro. Um, and I work at Eisenman Architects and Kelly Clark Kelly. Um, and when we both started teaching at UPenn in Philadelphia, we entered an international competition, which we didn't win, but it somehow kind of kickstarted our collaboration. And we established Forma, which is a professional licensed architecture studio sometime around 2018. Um, and I do think that having this kind of shared educational experience gives us common ground, but we do also bring different kind of backgrounds and perspectives to our practice. Uh, I was born and grew up in Slovakia in Central Europe, while Daniel is from US. Uh, he was born and kind of grew up in New York. And I tend to be more aspirational and optimistic. And I think Daniel kind of keeps us nicely, firmly um, on the ground. Um, and we also do both share a strong passion for design excellence and especially kind of commitment to our work. But uh, last but not least, um, I also try to not take ourselves too seriously. I think both Daniel and I understand that architecture is really a long-term long game. So often I like to return to this very first competition that Daniel and I entered together. And I think it somehow already captured some of our interests and ideas that have been kind of recurring in our practice ever since. Um, one would be to really work with familiar typologies in perhaps somewhat unfamiliar ways. So in this project, uh, which I'm not gonna go into in detail, but we paired a gabled roof structure of the existing paper factory, which is on the left of this image, with a bell tower, a kind of familiar element in many Italian towns. And from the outside, it perhaps appeared more as an aggregated village cluster rather than a singular building. Um, and on the inside, the linear bars create a kind of network of interconnected spaces with small exterior courtyards, which transition from a more rigid organization, which you can kind of see on the right, to a more looser ensemble of library spaces on the left. Um, a kind of interiorized landscape. And this kind of balance between rigidity and looseness, between order and whimsy, uh, between rational and intuitive, has been really something we've been interested in ever since this very first competition. So rather than thinking of these known terms as opposites, more frequently we've been wondering if architecture can exist in this in-between zone. So instead of seeing things in dialectically opposing terms, culture or nature, or singular or collective, we often ask, what if it could be both ordered whimsy or interiorized exterior? That's perhaps where some of our obsessions lie and where we see the greatest opportunities and kind of aspirations for our work, somewhere in between. Really hoping that what is produced is a kind of third new condition that encompasses aspects of both of these sides. Um, I think perhaps one of our greatest obsessions is the plant drawing. Uh, we love to work through orthographic plants. On one hand, the plant really offers a certain degree of freedom where you can quickly test spatial and organizational ideas in this two-dimensional orthographic space. But on the other hand, the plan really allows us to think through concepts in a clear and rigorous way. The truth is though, that the plan for us is never only two-dimensional artifact. It is always tied to ideas of how people kind of occupy three-dimensional space. Um, and we also love well-composed and intentional images and really start working with visualizations very early on in our process. So while the orthographic drawings provide a certain degree of abstraction and focus our ideas, the visualizations offer more kind of immersive explorations of these ideas through materiality, atmosphere, and specific ways of inhabiting space. So, uh, this was our very first client-based project we completed as Forma. Um, it was a conversion of existing residential apartments into communal gathering space for a student-run radio station called WYBCX in New Haven. And I won't go into that much detail here, but the use of color 
as an active spatial element has become one of those recurring themes in our work. I wouldn't call it quite an obsession, uh, at least not, not yet, but certainly something we've been interested in and explored in other projects afterwards. And this particular project, when may have been perceived as an obstacle, the project's extremely tight budget uh, had really pushed us to look at color as an opportunity to transform the interiors through this kind of inexpensive yet highly effective strategy. So here, the more active performance space is immersed in bright, deep orange, while the calmer gray envelopes the rest of the recording studio. And likewise, within the stairwell, a strong contrast of black and white kind of delineated the new stair guardrail. And at the top of the stairwell, before entering the bright and colored performance and recording studio, a kind of atmospheric threshold was created through which one passed from the vertical circulation zone into the recording space. So the idea that color itself can delineate and even transform our perception of space uh, independently or in conjunction with form is really something we've been quite interested in. Uh, and while we were working on the radio station project, we were approached by a Clinton Valley Development Group to envision a new project for South Central Newark. Um, it was a really interesting program. Uh, the idea was to create a programmatic hybrid between high quality traditional <laughs> housing for female veterans um, and a new martial arts for the local neighborhood. It was a corner lot, as you can see here, uh, with two party walls. So all the openings and all the entries had to be positioned along the two abouting streets. Um, the area has a rich history of colorful painted murals, uh, which were very, we were kind of very much inspired by during the site visits. And so the bold kind of graphic color on the proposed new facade was sort of a nod to this local context. Um, we thought that the colorful array of these perforated metal pan panels would nicely reflect the, the energy of the Black Belt Academy that would be located on the ground level and in the basement. And conceptually, the kind of bold graphic facade would also act as a protective shell for the building's female residents on the upper levels. This is a close up of the facade with the kind of separate entry for the female veteran residents on the right. Um, and this idea of bold and protective exterior shell and a soft inviting interior was especially important for the female residents who must deal with a variety of post-combat issues, uh, both physical and mental. So we designed a kind of warm muted palette of wood paneling, both in the common areas, which you can kind of see pictured here, um, and also in the modestly outfitted bedrooms. So the residents could kind of temporarily make themselves at home. Um, we presented the project to the Newark city officials who very much liked it, but unfortunately, the developer client was unable to raise the appropriate funds and the project was halted and ultimately never realized. Though we still love, love this kind of programmatic hybrid and hope that, you know, there will be a more developer interest uh, in, in such opportunities uh, that we might be able to collaborate with. Um, so I'm jumping to uh, a couple of projects that I'll show as a kind of set uh, of beach homes. Um, they are actually timeshares, which we developed somewhat concurrently. One is in Miami, Florida, and the other one on the left is in uh, Fire Island, New York, which we developed with, uh, with, with a friend and colleague, Mark Geddes. Uh, and I think these two projects kickstarted our kind of preoccupation with blurring the boundaries between the interior and exterior, really kind of looking for opportunities to create these interiorized exteriors. And since these were beach timeshares, we were also very interested in exploring the precarious relationship of the building to the ground. Also thinking of kind of how house can be a catalyst for collective encounters. And I'll briefly mention that. Um, so in many coastal houses, there is this increasing necessity to elevate the house above the ground to avoid rising sea levels and coastal erosion. This is actually an illustrative vacation home on the Bolivar Peninsula uh, here in Texas, uh, where the entire building is lifted on these narrow stilts 
Uh, and what was really interesting is that one of the main selling points in the rental description, which by the way, you can go and, and rent this particular house, uh, were the decks from which you can have an uninterrupted view of the, of the water. That was like really how they were trying to actually sell uh, this property, that, that having this kind of huge and you know, uh, multi-view decks is, is the thing to have. So our thought for the Miami house was why not elevate the most public part of the house, the deck to the top, which would maximize not only the views, but also the area of the most collective portion of a beach home use for entertainment and gathering. This is actually a competition model. Uh, we entered this project for a, for a small uh, competition, home competition, uh, that won a, an honorable mention. Um, but you can kind of see how the nature running is running uninterruptedly below uh, with the house volumes hanging from the occupiable pool deck. Um, and then the 10 aggregated volumes are wrapped in a thin veil of wooden screens. Um, which when fully closed would not only emphasize the volumetric quality of each unit, uh, but also the kind of curvature and shadow play that the roof deck would produce during the day. Um, and when open, uh, they would kind of break the orderly composition, composition and introduce more looser arrangement of openings on the facade. And the plan is organized along various by symmetries uh, the central open air stair links more intimate bedrooms which share a bathroom and a terrace, which you can kind of see on the left, uh, with the communal space of the kitchen, living, dining room that overlooks the ocean, which is positioned here uh, on the right side. And on the second level, as the stair landing shifts, the bedrooms are reversed. So this is one of these interiorized exteriors, as I mentioned before, that where the stairwell would be kind of covered partially in plants and would really provide a kind of lush oasis in the middle of the house as one circulated through from, you know, vertically uh, from space to space. Uh, this is the open communal kitchen uh, with a double height uh, space. And then beyond that is the dining and lounging area which would be shaded by the deep overhang of the pool deck above. And then at the at last, the roof deck with the pool and the kind of uninterrupted view of the ocean. So as I mentioned previously, we were thinking about and designing these two homes simultaneously. So in a way, I've always kind of considered them at almost as two variations of the same project. Uh, so if the Miami Beach House connection to the ground is through the columns, as you can see on the top. The Fire Island House, which I'm about to briefly talk about, really utilizes a series of walls organized along a central axis. So the Miami House is compact. The Fire Island House pulls the various portions of the house apart. Uh, for those of you who know or may not know, Fire Island um, has this really unique feature where instead of the roads and sidewalks, as in typical towns, all the houses are connected only by elevated boardwalks. And various trees and plants kind of peek around and surround the boardwalks. So um, we thought it was a really interesting way to kind of think about the organization of the house itself and really almost pull the boardwalk through the house, directly onto the beach. So rather than packing all the functions of the home into a singular volume, the kind of sleeping, bathing, living, and pool lounging are pulled apart between open air garden zones. And as a result, every space of the house would then have a direct connection to the natural environment through these again, interior, interior courtyards that are kind of open air. Um, and as one moves along, the spaces would expand and contract while reinforcing the single perspective view of the ocean, as you can see uh, in this image here. The plan is organized from the most private to the most public zones. So left to right on this slide, the bedroom suites separated by the open courtyard from the kitchen and living area which is again uh, separated from the communal pool deck overlooking the ocean um, on the right side of the slide. And then upstairs, additional two bedroom suites 
would be on the same on, on the second level, right above um, the two bedroom suites on, on, on the first level. Um, this is a view of the double story living room looking towards um, the sleeping quarters and then the pool uh, lounging area overlooking the ocean at the very end. Um, and the facade would really alternate between solid walls and vertical wooden screens, almost like a barcode, uh, which would provide additional privacy from the neighbors. At the same time, they would also allow the ocean breezes to kind of pass through into the middle of the house. And the idea was that this kind of natural ventilation would be sufficient to cool the house during hotter summer months without additional air conditioning. Um, in each case, we approached the design as an opportunity to really reconceive the house, not as a home for a single family or an individual, but as a place for like group of unrelated people with common interests that would come together to collectively own a home. So um, when the pandemic hit, Forma was only in its not even second year of existence. Uh, we shared an office with our friends from Almost Studio in Brooklyn. Uh, surrounded by artist studios where we're making physical models. This is during a competition shred, uh, so, so things are looking a little bit messy here. Uh, tables reshuffled, uh, but then uh, everything came to a halt, as much of the world around us did. Um, potential projects fell through, and we moved out of the office after paying rent for four months without visiting once. Um, However, the pandemic has also kind of presented opportunities for us to, to test how we can operate as a fully virtual office for a virtual studio. And as a result, I think we've become much more nimble and agile and resilient. Um, as many younger offices, especially in the US, most of our client-based work is currently residential renovations, uh, which I'm not going to discuss here tonight as Several of these projects are in various stages of development. This is actually Daniel on the left during one of, one of our site visits. Uh, but the value of these projects for many, you know, like there is a value for us in these projects for many different reasons, um, is they allow us to build relationships, not only with the clients, but also with our consultants, contractors, suppliers, and expand our knowledge of various bureaucracies of the building departments, especially in New York City and the kind of co-op boards and et cetera. Um, these are a couple of snapshots of a house renovation we recently completed in Denver, Colorado. Uh, the clients purchased the house without ever visiting in person. They lived in New York City, quarantined with a newborn baby. And this was also during the time when flying was heavily restricted due to the pandemic. Um, however, the obstacles quickly turned into an opportunity to really test a fully virtual working mode of designing and running a project virtually. Uh, it turned out beautifully. The whole process was seamless and efficient, which of course is a testament to, to the amazing clients and the contractor, Peter Sterling. Um, but I do not think this would be possible before the pandemic, as nobody was really used to a fully virtual process. Um, of course, this is no longer the case. And now many people are actually contractors and clients perfectly comfortable uh, with that mode of working. Uh, so this next project is for a client in Kingston, New York, who purchased during the pandemic to re-envision the landscape area around his house. It was a very delightful little project for us that presented kind of an opportunity to test some of these ideas of looseness and whimsy at a different scale. Uh, thinking how landscape and architecture can actually coexist together. Um, it's a beautiful property overlooking the Hudson River, which is at the bottom of the image you cannot see here, um, with multiple smaller structures organized loosely throughout. Um, our focus was um, at the area between the house, which you can kind of see on the bottom right, and the small shed building in the upper middle next to an existing pond, which you can kind of see in the middle of the circle. Um, the main issue was that the neighboring house at the top of the hill is overlooking the entire property. And as one of the main tasks was to really come up with a strategy that creates privacy for the client's backyard and also thinks about the kind of entire space between the shed and the house uh, that could be utilized for entertainment, relaxation, kind of lounging. So it was equally a problem of section 
as it was a problem of the plan. Um, the relatively steep topography really required a sectional strategy, which would kind of work with existing retaining walls that you can kind of see snaking through here in this image. So we created a series of cascading decks that would act as oversized steps and also provide areas of rest and pause around the existing pond. Uh, we were trying to avoid a rigid formal gesture and so an opportunity really to create a more playful composition of various zones of activity uh, that may more kind of spontaneously happen along this ensemble. Um, in this plan, you can also see a specific planting strategy that, that, that we kind of designed that would delineate different zones of the property uh, from the kind of grow of taller trees to show the area visually from the neighbors. So this on the kind of upper portion of the plan to the vertical garden along the curved retaining walls and the kind of larger overall shape zone with low shrubbery that would hold the whole composition together. Um, the overlaps of those rectangles in plan would be actually three-dimensionalized as Boolean cuts, providing steps to transverse the topography. Um, and the client was also really interested in incorporating a hot tub within the garden. So here the idea was to have almost like a Japanese onsen nestled into the landscape surrounded by various clients. Um, they're currently kind of working through, through implementing the um, process, the design, but we are actually not part of it. We, we provided the kind of uh, site plan and design study uh, and the uh, clients are actually taking it into their own hands. Um, so it was really during this time that we've had a few kind of near misses with these potential clients and really decided that perhaps it is time for us to develop our own project. So here in this uh, next project or show, uh, we are the client, the investor, and the architect. Um, we embarked on an extensive search along Hudson River, which is an area north of New York City. Um, and through this process, we really learned what qualities make kind of a piece of land desirable. Um, Daniel and I must have seen about like 100 properties, taking turns and making trips to visit and evaluate the various parcels of land for sale. This is just a snapshot of some of the ones that we visited. Um, at the same time, we kind of search comparative properties, what has been sold, what has been on the market for a while and why, and really started to develop a financial strategy. Um, and finally, after months of searching, we found a perfect site. It already had electric on site with a little shed that you can see in the image and was partially cleared at the apex of kind of gentle hill. Uh, we did a little bit of additional clearing around this area, but from the beginning, we knew that we wanted a compact house uh, and leave most of the land undisturbed, which was really beautiful. Um, I cannot even tell you how many obstacles we've encountered during the process so far. Uh, all of them, of course, related to the pandemic. Um, but I can tell you that patience and perseverance are, are true virtues. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, we designed two very different houses, which I'll briefly walk you through now, but we will be actually building the one on the left. Um, so our project folder is packed with many different studies of various typologies, organizational strategies, uh, material thoughts, um, just generally for any, any project, we love to work iteratively and test many different ideas uh, before settling on one. And this project was no different. Um, actually, Corey mentioned at the beginning, but I think we do also like to kind of through this process almost work with certain like prototypes or like pro, you know, pre architecture that then perhaps maybe utilized for another project. Um, so this is basically just a kind of uh, snapshot of all the various studies, drawings, collages, renderings that we've gone through. Um, but the first home we developed was a compact box sitting at the top of the hill, oriented south with its longer edge. And it was really conceived as a kind of clearly defined volume, which is carved at specific locations and sits on kind of top of loosely organized series of terraces. And the loose pile was, def 
you know, that, that you can kind of see on the ground was definitely an idea that we kind of continued from the previous landscape project um, that I just showed uh, right before. Um, but then like a monolithic part stone, like the kind of conceptual model, uh, there will be a distinction between the outermost facade of the box, which would be cladded in silver blue standing seam metal, pretty standard, um, and the carved zones, which would be faced with warm cedar wood siding. So almost kind of like an apple or a peach, you know, when, when the thin skin kind of hides the juicy interior. Uh, so this south facade would have larger openings and the cars cladded in wood would create more intimate pockets of exterior space where one could sit and overlook the landscape while being partially protected. And then the northern facade would have smaller openings and the only figure that would be carved out and cladded in this warmer wood uh, would accentuate the main entry into the house. Um, the simple rectangular plan is divided into three zones. The central living room area, which is flanked on one side by a private bedroom suite, which was kind of ideal for multi-generational living that we were kind of thinking about at that time. And on the other side would be a kind of spacious kitchen, which would be overlooking a pond on the east side of the property. And the idea was that the ground level of the house is closely surrounded by flower and vegetable gardens that are organized in this loose pile um, with a large south facing deck that you can kind of see in the drawing connected to the living and dining area. Um, this is the view uh, looking south with bifolding door system for continuous kind of connection to the outside. And materially, the rotated deck that you saw in the plan would register on the ceiling and ground with wood in different orientation from the main floor, producing a kind of volumetric reading of that intersection between the house and the deck. And then um, we were developing the house, as I mentioned, during the pandemic. So we were conscious of providing enough space for each one of the upper bedrooms for a kind of work desk as needed uh, with an additional kind of small flexible zone adjacent to the staircase. Uh, we produced a detailed pricing set, but after receiving several cost estimates from different contractors, we realized that with the extreme escalation of material prices and labor shortages, we will, we will need to completely switch gears as this design was just simply no longer feasible for us financially, at least at that moment. So we went back to drawing board, started from square one, basically. Uh, and there were three main objectives for us moving forward. Um, number one was working with more familiar typology. Number two was minimizing square footage. And number three was making all the bedrooms accessible at ground level. So these are just some of our kind of earlier studies and Zoom conversations as we've kind of developed this working method of always drawing uh, on, on our screens. Um, and although the pitch roof barn typology, and you'll see it in, in following slides, has really become very popular these days, uh, we knew we did not want a simple barn structure. And there are so many of these modern barns popping around everywhere. And in retrospect, I think we were looking for a completely opposite approach to our first design. But I also think that we were interested in testing some of our kind of earlier ideas about aggregation and loose clustering and piling and what that means in the context of a house. So if the first house was designed from the outside in, uh, this one was definitely the opposite. We designed it from the inside out. Um, so unlike the previous house I showed, the, the, here the house functions are actually pulled apart into separate independent volumes. And the top lid entry four acts as a kind of hinge point between the main bedroom suite, the two smaller bedrooms, and then the living kitchen area. And each room is accessible at the ground level and has its own view of the landscape through large windows and openings. Um, and this way the privacy is preserved if desired and hanging together is kind of optional. Um, and then the spiral staircase that you can see in this plan connects to the extra work and play space located uh, among the gables upstairs. Um, so, this new 
three gable cluster transforms the familiar barn typology of upstate New York through materiality and repetition. And the three volumes are connected with a central tower element, which marks kind of the tucked away entry to the house, which is at the back in this image, um, and also acts as a kind of oversized chimney um, with a skylight at the top. And unlike the previous house, where the two materials visually broke the box apart, here the durable standing seam metal panels wrap around the elements of the house, visually unifying the cluster and really kind of accentuate the volumetric reading of the gable volume. Um, visual connections across the house and to the surrounding landscapes were really important uh, for us. And they're kind of choreographed, uh, you know, throughout. Um, thinking, always like thinking of standard sized windows. Um, and here you can specifically see the connection to the south facing deck that would be kind of directly uh, adjacent to the living and dining room area. Uh, we spent a lot of time studying various aspects of the home from its orientation on the site, the interior organization of the rooms, uh, the relationship to the landscape and how it kind of affects both the views and the interior lighting conditions, uh, to the material choices and their financial and aesthetic impact on the house. Um, here, for example, you can also see the kind of familiar gable shape that is perfectly legible in this view looking towards the kitchen. And beyond that is actually the pond. While looking the opposite direction, the gable reading is a bit complicated by the kind of slender fireplace that stretches upward, the figural opening to the entry floor beyond, and then the kind of curved edges of the volume. So in a way, erasing the two corners. Um, needless to say, we, with the constantly changing material and labor prices, the, the project has been a bit of a roller coaster, uh, but we received the building permit last month are currently waiting for pricing estimates uh, to come back and are like super excited to start the construction hopefully this spring. So fingers, fingers crossed that uh, it, will, it will move smoothly or more smoothly. Um, the last two projects I will show uh, share some affinities in terms of their formal strategy, although with very different programs. So on the left is a top view of a physical model for a preschool that we did. And on the right is an image of a physical model for a bathhouse. Both projects share this idea of a fifth facade, kind of roofscape, um, having direct spatial, atmospheric, and environmental implications on architecture. And they also, in a way, illustrate our obsession <laughs> with squares. Uh, or perhaps more specifically, simple elemental geometries that organize more complex arrangements of interior spaces. Um, so the first project I'll show was an open competition for a design of a preschool in rural area on the southern side of Mozambique. Um, it was a sparsely populated area with minimal infrastructure, as you can see here. So our first question was, um, what is the local context that can help us situate the project? And also, how does the building create its own context? A lot of local building techniques utilize these masonry walls that are paired with elevated roofs with deep overhangs and to kind of protect the walls from the rain and permeable screens to let air pass through, while they also filter light uh, to the interiors. So we really wanted to tap into this collective knowledge of local building constructions that developed over time in response to the kind of local climate and material and labor availability. Um, this was also the first project where our desire for a kind of looser relationship between the buildings and the landscape really developed. Um, we were interested in something that may seem a bit more random, even playful in its organization. And for this specific project, uh, we were looking at Michael Heiser's photographs. Uh, this one in particular, the levitated mass was from 2015, uh, which really strongly influenced actually our overall approach to the site. 
And we really liked how some of these clearly defined figures sat loosely within this random field of gestural lines and color patches. Um, but we also wanted to organize the building with a more rational and a rigorous way. So our final submission, and this is a type of a kind of physical competition model uh, that we made, uh, placed a square courtyard building towards the top of the sloping site. So you can kind of see a little bit the topography lines. Um, it's actually sloping down towards upper right. Um, and this courtyard would coexist with a series of these scattered playgrounds, pathways, and short retaining walls that were loosely organized across the sloping landscape. And these various elements would weave the surrounding exterior through the interior of the building. And the idea was that since children often learn through play, uh, these exterior classrooms nestled in the landscape kind of encourage them from very early uh, age to learn about their native plants and various aspects of local agriculture. So for example, in the upper right corner is an um, orchard, uh, while the rectangular areas in the landscape that are kind of scattered around would house outdoor classes related to exploring the natural environment. Um, however, the, instead of creating a kind of single courtyard building, the preschool would be housed within a cluster of nine smaller volumes that are organized around a unifying square uh, in the middle. And each room would be entered from within that courtyard. So this organizational strategy would kind of encourage interaction and, and a sense of community at the center, while the passages between the rooms would allow for kind of fluid connections between the interior of the courtyard and the surrounding uh, landscape. Uh, this physical model shows the building without the roof. So the four gable uh, volumes that are kind of loosely positioned on top uh, of the flat square roof, which is not shown here, uh, would register below through color projection and mark some of the kind of primary entries into the courtyard. Um, the cross section here actually shows this relationship of the rotated gables and a flat roof and, and the passage between the classrooms. And actually, this close up um, really kind of shows the proposed tectonic system, uh, which was quite simple. Corrugated metal roof supported by open web steel joists, which sit on top of stabilized earth brick walls. And then the large overhangs would protect the interior during heavy rains, while the open joists together with this kind of permeable screens uh, would allow air to circulate through the classrooms. Um, and this is how we envision the building in its context. And, and this last close-up of the overhanging kind of gable roofs and the partially covered courtyard space really shows this moment of this interiorized exterior that I mentioned earlier uh, during the talk. So I will end with this last project we recently worked on. Um, it is a self-generated project uh, that really was spurred by another competition we previously worked on. Uh, which was for a revitalization of city baths and public library located in Bratislava, the capital of Slovakia, where I'm from. Um, increasingly, I think like we are looking for opportunities to really merge our practice and teaching uh, closer together. Uh, Daniel and I teach both semesters during the year, uh, various graduate studios. And for the past couple of years, we work on both the kind of preschool and bath program, uh, both in our studios at school and also kind of self-initiated experimental projects in the office. Um, partially based on our investigations, you know, initiated during these kind of earlier international competitions. So this project is one of, one of these projects. Uh, and we kind of speculated on the possibility of new hybrid typology where the leisurely activities of a bathhouse are paired with the utilitarian functions of a data center. Um, but before I dive into the last project a bit more closely, I want to briefly mention this Bratislava competition, which really kind of originated this bathhouse project I'll, I'll talk about. 
Um, the Bratislava brief outlined a very complex program which needed to negotiate the existing buildings on the given site, part of which was an old bathhouse that became derelict in the past few decades. Uh, and again, like I won't go into that much detail here, but we felt that the large and complex program really needed to be organized with a clear organizational strategy that could hold the various elements and idiosyncrasies of the existing structures together. Uh, we achieved this with a simple square that would provide a clear circulation path. It would kind of cut through some of the existing uh, uh, existing spaces, and also we would propose new smaller aggregated spaces along some of the edges um, that would kind of, you know, hold the whole bath complex together. Um, and the gradient you can see in the plan drawing actually indicates the change in coloration of the tiled interior, which would kind of demarcate the central square zone. So the idea of material, color, circulation, and spatial organization were really all tightly knit together. Um, and the interior tiles we proposed were based on the design of an original tile found on site, uh, which we proposed would be produced in 10 different shades of blue and could be reconfigured in four different pattern orientations. Um, so one would circulate through these heavily atmospheric and color saturated spaces of the main baths. Uh, such as the central pool area, which would be kind of juxtaposed with more intimate, smaller zones for relaxation. So, so such as the small kind of floating pool, and we had a series of the smaller spaces that would kind of mark uh, and be within the, within the large square, or the mist room surrounded by plants, uh, or a kind of what we call sphere room with a central oculus. Um, so the idea was that there would be this kind of multi-sensory experiences that would actually be sprinkled around the entire bath complex. Um, we didn't win, but we received an honorable mention <laughs> for the unique use of light and creation of different atmospheres uh, within the project. So in the office, we really wanted to kind of push some of these ideas and explorations further. And I think through a project that could exist a little bit outside of an urban context um, and potentially in an American desert, kind of destination getaway for, for both the body and, and, and the soul. Um, so this project also kind of further explores some of the already mentioned themes of, of looseness and rigidity and, and the idea that the building may not be kind of hermetically closed interior, but rather it's inside might be more loosely connected to the surrounding environment. Um, and the roofscape shown here in this physical study model from, from above is a kind of aggregation of conic volumes clustered around the kind of periphery in various densities uh, with a large central square cone above uh, an interior pool. Um, and then the organization below the roof is a little bit more cellularized with large rectangular pools kind of extending beyond the periphery of the building. But unlike the Mozambique project that I just showed for the preschool where the landscape really pushes through and into the project, uh, here the interiors of the building are really pulled out into the landscape. Um, we were reading about subterranean data centers being built uh, and kind of proposed in various places uh, in the past few, few years and wondered how we could kind of capitalize on this wasted heat from these data servers. Um, and we thought kind of wouldn't it be a great opportunity to really provide great amenities for people to enjoy collectively. Um, so the idea here is that the access heat from the fully subterranean data center is dispersed into a series of kind of loosely organized pools, which would provide collective hot spring-like experience. Um, and we really also like how the square would contain the interiors, but how the pools would break through the periphery and connect to, to the landscape. So the kind of temperature differences also 
uh, as one moves from this kind of full exterior to this interiorized exterior and deeper into kind of fully almost interior interior uh, was quite interesting for us. Um, from far away, the building is almost like a mountainscape uh, and the pink coloration would provide a kind of nice contrast to the surrounding desert landscape. We didn't want it to kind of blend in. We really wanted to actually accentuate uh, its presence. Um, and this is a close-up view of one of these openings where the pool extends out uh, into and past the kind of square periphery. Um, the idea of these kind of interiors is that similar to the kind of ephemerality of global data flows, the data center is fully subterranean and kind of hidden from the site. And all the visual, auditory, olfactory experiences are really concentrated within the kind of colorful interiors of these thermal baths. Um, this is just a close up of one of the openings between the rooms. Um, and I think the aspiration for these kind of larger coning shapes um, of these various rooms was to add a touch of also like kind of almost like calming monumentality, while the geometry of the cone would also kind of help control the interior air temperature. Um, so this is my last slide, um, just kind of showing how we envisioned the sun and the light play within the interior of some of these rooms. And that's all I have. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. That was a great lecture. Really, really amazing work. Um, so I think I'll just open the floor if you have time for a few uh, questions. Of course. Um, you know, people Let can me... ask them here in the chat or I'm also watching YouTube now and my email. So however they come at me um, or feel free to raise your hand and I'll call on you. John, John Blood. You're muted. I think you're muted. Still muted. Yeah, I'll, I'll read it if you type it. Oh, there you go. You got it. I'm here, Pat. It's good to see you. Hi, hi, hi John. Hi. Really excited. good to see you. It's very excited to have you here. It's beautiful, beautiful work and, and a great lecture. Um, Thank you. Uh, yeah, very, very nice. Uh, I'm, I'm particularly excited about the way that you're juxtaposing and combining opposites. I think that's a very, very poetic and, and powerful thing. Uh, and I was, I was, I'm, um, I'm curious about the imagery that you're using and how it is infuses and informs the design process. I mean, it's clearly, I mean, you said earlier that you have a, an interest in well-composed images and that the, the, the imagery of the building itself uh, uh, is an important thing. And the, the, I suppose that they are rendered images, but it looks like you have Yuan Bond photographing your finished project. But I'm interested in how that, and how using this tool and how, the, how you study these in imagery, how it feeds back into the design process. And if you want to say anything about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, thank you for the question, John. Yeah, I think, um, uh, yeah, the images are, are very much part of the design process. And so, as I mentioned earlier, like we typically start with, with plans and sketches, you know, thinking through the plan, but almost, almost simultaneously, we jump into a 3D and start really looking at some of the spaces and moves that we are making in plan three-dimensionally. So like through like, and like quite specifically, you know, really composing specific views of how one might actually experience and perceive uh, what we are designing. I think it's, um, you know, it's also a way for us to get excited about the project and to get clients excited about the project, to be quite frank, because many times um, I think what you're drawing uh, kind of more abstractly, uh, kind of stays a little bit literally abstract right in your mind. And as soon as you start really exploring it through, through the images, I think like there is a kind of feedback back and forth uh, between what, what you see as a kind of three-dimensional space with atmosphere and color and materials. And then what you actually see a little bit more kind of abstractly as a kind of organizational strategy, right? Or a way to structure the space. Um, and so, um, I think, you know, there has been a lot of uh, conversations lately and, and through really the past 
20 and 21st century about the role of images and the kind of hyper-realistic images versus the kind of collaged and more abstract images. Um, and I think for us, really, it's, it's one of those obsessions, to be honest. It's something that kind of drives us also um, and that drives the process. Uh, as much as as it's kind of a, just a final you know output, it never is a final output. Let's put it that way. Often, like we finish a competition, and a lot of these projects that I showed, we, we finish a project or a competition, submit it. You know, we we get an honorable mention or not, but then we work on the images later. Like we 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 keep continue to kind of work on some of the images, uh, based on feedback, based on comments, you know, based on kind of discussions that we have in the office. Um, so they are very much a kind of uh, working um, tool, uh, even though they might actually see very polished, you know, appear very polished. Um, nice, thank you. Yeah. If I could, just, I just kind of want to add to John's question because um, rendering is dear to my heart. I had a business for a while doing it, so I got also very obsessed with it. Mm. And I think what's so interesting is like you know, when you're rendering glass, there are different types of caustics, different index of refractions. And when you really get to that level of the physics of the material itself, there's a lot of variation in how that then is reproduced in rendering, the effects of what different glasses produce, the way you see the space. And so I wonder if there's ever a moment, I mean, it's clear that when you're making and crafting an image, you might think, well, okay, I need more landscape here. And you actually start to engage in right. landscape design or more interior design in this space. And so I engage, you know, these different disciplines within the work. I wonder how often you use it to um, speculate on, on the work itself or, or speculate on the material into a territory that's not necessarily real. Like, even mm -hmm. though it still looks real, is there ever moments where you go into the unrealistic with that same level of precision? Mm. Oh, that's a great question. I mean, I was thinking, you know, so this very last project, the, the thermal baths, um, I don't know if you noticed, there are a few images that had actually furniture in them, uh, which were also just designed by us. Like it was something that like we felt like, you know, you're designing a building or you're thinking through it, uh, or the kind of building landscape scale, but inevitably you are starting to think about the use of these spaces and then projecting the kind of, possible reality onto that image. And we knew that, you know, the kind of standard furniture that you can find from cat blocks just was not going to make it. And so we started doing a little bit of just research, thinking about like, okay, what would fit? Like, what are some of the ideas materially, uh, spatially, again, formally, that might actually fit within the, the story of the project? Um, and so that, that was actually a perfect example of this last project where we also like the furniture, for example, kind of became part, part of that story uh, and we designed it, you know, as, as part, of, part of the project itself. Um, yeah. Oh, I think you're muted, Corey. Uh, Benito. <laughs> Hi, uh, I really enjoyed your work and uh, it was really refreshing to see radial uh, being implied in plan and elevation. So um, as I was looking at it, I was thinking, uh, do you all ever see yourself or see your firm uh, potentially working on a 3D printed competition? I mean, 3D printed architecture? Yes. Uh-huh. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I'm getting like very excited <laughs> with some of these technologies because uh, I think they're kind of really closing the gap between you know, what we are very used to, which is kind of model making as architects and the building making. And so I think uh, it's becoming, and the images are the same way, right? I think that like we now have this ability to almost work at the kind of real scale simultaneously as we are designing. Um, and so I think it's actually a, a something that I personally would definitely be interested in it. I, and I know Dan, Daniel, I'm sure would be too. Uh, we haven't really thought about it, to be honest. So, I mean, we, we have 3D printers, obviously we, we, you know, like use 3D printers for model making, um, but if we haven't really looked at the kind of 3D printed technology for, for buildings, but that's definitely something that I think is, you know, on the horizon. Um, even, I mean, for example, again, this last project, I mean, really thinking about it just on the go, I think that could potentially be done through 3D printed technology. Yes, it would have to be, you know, studied more carefully, but I think, um, yeah, 
there's a potential for it too. So, yeah. Great. Um, are there any more questions? By the way, we'll have to introduce you to there. Um, there's a 3D printing company here, Icon, that are 3D printing homes and for Mars. So we'll take, we'll take you on a drive yeah. down there. Yeah. Yep. Yep. There's a whole neighborhood, right? That is going to be mm -hmm. built. Yeah. But may I just say to that, um, I think, you know, it's actually a great opportunity for us as architects to really kind of think about this technology in new ways. And I am worried, at least the images that I saw of this project uh, are very, very conventional in terms of, I don't mean it uh, conventional in terms of form, but really thinking about habitation. And so that's why I think we as architects should actually pay attention to these things and should get excited about these things because they are things that um, uh, other industries are thinking about but we have the potential to really kind of think about, uh, you know, uh, how we lift through these technologies in, in different ways. Um, and so, um, yeah, anyway, just a side note. Yeah. Are there any other questions for Miroslava? I can say I'm very excited about the conversations that we're gonna be having soon when you're here on campus. Uh, so looking forward to that so much. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Yeah, I'm just, I'm going to eavesdrop when you're talking to your students from, from my, <laughs> my group next door. <laughs> um, well, it's oh, great was to like, have you. Yeah, let's go ahead. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I just saw the chat question, which I think was Benita, but it was the chimney in the common space here at the same height as the, as the tower. Uh, I think it's uh, a little bit taller. Just a, uh, just a tad taller. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you very much for coming. It was a great lecture and um, we look forward to having you very, very soon, hopefully. Great. Thank you so much, everyone. Good to see you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.